Um, so the focus for today is optimization of athlete recovery. And I guess recovery in itself, sorry, I should actually start by thanking um, Matt and uh, also Corey and Peter and Football New South Wales for the invite to pour a form of me not to start off with a thank you, but appreciate and acknowledge the great work to start this off. Now we'll get started in terms of looking at athlete recovery in the sense that the, re the notion of recovery has taken on its own identity over the last decade. Recovery used, used to be something that happened, passive, and it's less important than training. Um, and these days it's probably in some cases almost equivalent to the importance of training, probably inappropriately so. So what we want to look through today is quickly what is recovery, giving a definition and a concept, um, and then going through some key recovery issues in terms of the loads that you've, you've heard a bit about, sleep, nutrition, some of the more sexier ones with cold water immersion and compression, and finish off with the concept of fitness. So really in the interest of time, it's really just a taster, a teaser on each of these topics rather than a real in-depth look at all of them. So what is recovery? Well, initially there's some sort of load. There's some sort of stimulus that drives this either physiological change or a reduction in the ability to perform, i.e. fatigue. Right? So it causes some sort of suppression. So recovery, right away, you've got to think about, is proportional to the load. So recovery doesn't necessarily exist without the existence of load. And the extent of that load drives the recovery. So if you have a new type of load or a different type of load, so a different type of a session, a higher intensity session, it's gonna change that recovery profile. The idea for us as practitioners is to try and shift that recovery profile to the left, or certainly to your left. Ignore that whole super compensation kind of thing, it doesn't really exist like this we're just looking at that first part. So as a practitioner, we want to shift that to the left to have an athlete prepared to do more work earlier or at least be in a better state to compete, ideally. So that's the idea of recovery. In reality, we're never getting an athlete back to a pure baseline or a pure pre-exercise baseline. It's getting them there or thereabouts, as is optimal in the situation. But recovery is also multifactorial. So it's not one single concept of recovery. In order to be prepared to be on the day, obviously there's a performance aspect. So that performance aspect is what sort of speed, what sort of power through a particular technical capacity or technical ability. That's true performance recovery. It's the most important conceptually, but it's the hardest to know, the hardest to really understand because you're not gonna do a maximal all out test right before you, the athlete needs to compete or the player needs to train. So, counterintuitive to what you want. There's also a physiological state. So changing carbohydrate stores, hydration, a whole host of other physiological aspects. And because of the sexiness of the science behind it, and I'll put my hand up for you know, driving that sexiness as well, somewhat sexy, now this is taken on as an importance from a scientific community and it's kind of then transgressed into the, the, the lay literature of the importance of physiological recovery. And it is important, but in the end, the the ability to perform, i.e. physical performance, is the key outcome for recovery. But there's also a human being you know, that we're talking about behind us. So the mental or the perceptual state of recovery is also critical. Often this is undervalued because it's a bit of, you know, well, it's not really objective, is it? Asking a player how they feel. You, know, you want to go up and put the arm around and say, how do you feel? It's like, yeah, I'm fine, okay. It's not normal for a football environment. But it's still critical, and ironically, it's the easiest data to get, or the easiest information, I should say, to get, regardless of being data. All these different concepts will have a different timeline themselves. So when we talk about recovery, you know, we're talking about recovery of physical ability to perform, the physiological state, and or the perceptual mental state of the athlete, because they all have their own timelines and their own respective um, uh, concepts. So regardless of that, having differentiated them, I'll ignore my own definitions and then treat them as holistic in my next approach. But when we're looking at improving that recovery profile, okay, don't forget your big drivers. I'm gonna give you my take home message if there's such a thing right now up front because I'll hark back to it throughout the presentation. The big drivers of recovery are what you need to focus on, particularly in the levels below professional athletes where you have an abundance of time, all the money in the world and all the facilities you could dream of. 
not that that really exists for everyone, but certainly in that NPL level where time is short, finances are strained, and resources, i.e. people, are limited, it's key focus to worry about your big drivers, big drivers of recovery. And they are likely to be the load, <coughs> nutrition, or nutritional aspects, and probably to a lesser extent, sleep. Your sexy one percenters, they may be more or less than one percenters, cold water immersion, compression, massage, wrapping yourself in seaweed, whatever you enjoy, that's not actually a key one, but they're the small ones, right? They're not gonna be the things that drive big recovery, but they're sexy, professional athletes do it, and they normally cost money. As well as looking at those big drivers, it's as important to worry about avoidance of the things that are gonna retard or prevent recovery, which are quite often inappropriate load, you know, poor sleep, poor nutrition, high alcohol consumption. So avoidance of those factors is just as good, if not better, than worrying about the one to two percenters of the little stuff of, you know, am I getting five minutes or 10 minutes in cold water immersion? So that's what I want to explore a little bit now. It's really about optimizing rather than getting that perfect recovery or avoiding suboptimal recovery. So let's look at training and match loads. We've heard a fair bit about load already. You're probably uh, over it or tired about it, but it is critical because the existence of the load is the thing that will drive fatigue and the driving of fatigue, or the existence of fatigue, sorry, is what recovery is, is a response to. So just to kind of give the last probably 45 minutes of your life in one slide, um, load is a multifactorial concept as well. It could be the distances that the athlete covers. It could be the number or the magnitude of accelerations and decelerations. It's the physical contact, player on player, player on ground. And it's the stress through a mechanical load. In this case, often through you know bilateral limb in a kicking or or movement proficiency. That collection, that collection of all those elements leads to this presence of fatigue and the recovery of those that fatigue. And to an essence, see seeing that kind of figure down the bottom of you know a load fatigue recovery, load fatigue recovery is the perfect situation. The reality is the larger the load to the individual player, the bigger the fatigue and the longer the recovery response. It's an individualized response. So, what does it take to recover from a football match? Given that a football match, you know, close to 90 minutes is likely the biggest load of any week. Best evidence to date is 72 hours. So this figure comes from one of Greg DuPont's <coughs> where they looked at a range of studies in the timeline of different markers, physical performance markers, following matches or simulated matches. What they found was within 72 hours, most physical performance aspects, peak power, peak speed, ability to do repeated efforts, is recovered within about 72 hours. The only athletes that weren't recovered in 72 hours were lower level, so semi-professional, who actually did simulated matches, i.e. they did more work in the simulation than they, what they probably would do in a normal match. Although Tim's data may dispute that, but certainly for these guys. So within 72 hours, most physical performance factors or markers have recovered. What happens when you have a match on? And that's the big issue. Most players can handle 90 minutes, recover, and play again a week later. What happens when there's a match on? I congested schedules. There's a range of studies. I've just picked out one. And what it essentially, what it essentially shows from a physical performance, so match distances, is nothing. Right? So there's no effect in that players Players can basically perform a match, come back 72 hours, and their physical performance is pretty much the same. 48 hours, you're starting to find reductions in performance and losses in terms of match outcomes. But by 72 hours, most data shows that players can perform, certainly professional players. But what's that then doing to the recovery of the player? Because we know that to play again, training loads decrease. So coaches, Pretty smart people reduce the load, reduce the number of sessions, reduce the type of sessions, and they have more rest and recovery. Some data that we collected with the Wanderers through their big congested schedule periods shows that essentially recovery gets worse. So whether it's perceived wellness or whether it's say markers of groin strength, that second match, so they have a match, 72 hours later, another match, and then 
the setting two hours after that, their recovery profile is suppressed. So although the players can get up for that match and they can perform the physical demands of that match, it leaves them in a worse recovery state following. Okay, so it makes sense. Big load of the match, you have fatigue, recover by 72 hours. Another big load of a match, 72 hours after that, recovery is dampened even worse. Okay? Which is fine if you have short congested schedules. When those congested schedules go on and on, coaches do the obvious thing, they're very in tune, they reduce the training loads. That's fine. Except when you have extended periods of that, and here's an example of a sub elite team from a university in, in England, where you have long periods of congested schedules. So in this case, it was six weeks of playing two matches a week, which is pretty extreme. Okay. Physical capacity starts to reduce. So we can see that yo-yo fitness, so yo-yo scores in terms of aerobic fitness, and I think it's uh, counter movement jump, so peak power, is reduced when you have regular congested schedules. So in order to recover, you take away the training load. That's fine for their short-term recovery, but if you're regularly taking away the short-term recovery, or sorry, taking away the short-term loads, then you minimize the training stimulus and you leave an athlete that doesn't have high enough fitness over the extent of the period. So the easiest thing to say is they're fatigued, have recovery, remove the training load. Except the more you remove the training load, okay, the less they train and the less physical stimulus they have. So it's not as easy as just recovery is doing nothing. There needs to be planned, individualized recovery. You didn't get high minutes, you can train again. Okay? That's an easy thing to say to someone who's paid full time to do SNC, a little bit more difficult at the NPL level where basically resources and finances are tied. But that's where it comes to this point. Do you train more or do you train smarter? I mean, the classic figure that Tim showed that sets off alarm bells for most sports scientists is high load in that time period high uncontrolled load in that time period immediately past following a match. Right? So trying to maintain athletes in this acute fatigue to you know, slightly overreaching or what we call a functional overreaching state is the ideal training status. So recovery is not just a given, okay? certainly by adjusting load. The more load that's present, the more will affect fatigue and the more recovery may be required. But a long-term approach may also be important, whereby sometimes it's important still to train. Again, that's an individualised response. Be aware of the load factor, but don't take for granted that no training is better for recovery immediately. All right, so that's having turned a black and white issue grey in terms of uh, load, the presence of load. We'll have a look at uh, sleep. Sleep's one of those things whereby it's kind of a magic bullet at the moment. Uh, we did a study a while ago where we looked at a, a team, uh, this is in New Zealand, doing two training sessions back to back. On one occasion, they had a normal night's sleep. On another occasion, they had no sleep. So they just loved us, right? <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, and funnily enough, we, what we find with full, deep, uh, full sleep deprivation is that they go worse. They're in a physiological worse state. Even though that their nutritional intake was the same, their muscle carbohydrate was severely reduced following the night of no sleep. Okay? And they went worse. They went worse from the start. They had poorer mood, they had poorer strength, they're in a worse physiological state, and they just hated us and being there. Not surprising. Okay? But the reality is full sleep deprivation doesn't really exist, or certainly not in professional sport. And if it exists in sub-elite sport, it's because of decision making of what you're doing the night, Saturday, Friday night, and not because of other factors. So what do players get in terms of sleep? Certainly at the, at the more professional level, uh, we <coughs> see that generally football players, they're living the dream, right? They're, they're actually getting pretty good sleep on most nights. They're quite often up around the seven and a half or eight to eight and a half, nine hours. When they do have issues, it's normally match night. As we can see on that slide, there's a big reduction on match nights because finish is late, there's post, uh, post-match function, post-match socialising in a hallway and maybe even travel. So generally outside of those times, you know, sleep is pretty decent and for the sub-elite NPL kind of level, that puts it more in the territory of generic population sleep, which is okay but not great in terms of seven and a half, eight hours. But you need to lose a lot of sleep 
okay, to actually affect physical performance. And even when your sleep is affected, the reasons are quite diverse. Okay, so two examples of players who have generally bad sleep but performed well. One had a newborn child. Right? So even in a professional level, you're not going to say, okay, just go and sleep in another room and ignore your newborn child. It's key ways to end a marital or relationship status, and it's quite inappropriate to be affecting you know, the player's lifestyle like that. The other one, I still don't really know why it says, but toilet breaks. Obviously had some sort of you know, bladder issue or urinary tract infection, I don't know, but was up way too much many, most nights for sleep. So it's not even a case that it's obvious what the issue is or that sleep is an issue, but we know full sleep deprivation is bad, and that generally in football, sleep disruption will occur match nights, certainly late night match. So how can we overcome that? Oh, sorry, actually before I get to that. The training loads as well is often reported as an influence as to why sleep is reduced. So some work we did with a local NRL club showed that um, sleep was reduced, so sleep volumes were reduced on high training load weeks. Okay, so that's in the red. Except the reason was not the training load itself, but it was more that because a high training load week had more training sessions, more training sessions started at 8 a.m., so they had to get out of bed earlier. So the reason that training affected sleep was because they were getting up early to go to training sessions, yet still going to bed at the same time. It speaks to what is quite often the issue around sleep for recovery, is the behavioural issues. How players enact with their sleeping processes, how they perform sleep, how they get themselves ready for sleep. Obviously the other big thing there is late night matches. So late night matches are normally the biggest driver of poor sleep. They also occur at the time when recovery is meant to be high, or meant to be the greatest. So what do we do? Well again, we look at this concept of sleep hygiene. Okay? So behavioural elements to improve how players or how people engage in their sleeping patterns. A study we did in Germany with Tim Meyer, who's um, head of the, the, the German medical, uh, or the German team's medical group. And we took two fifth division Bundesliga teams. They played each other in a crossover. Um, each night after the match, we got half the group, we got them all back to the training center and fed by 11.30. And then we got one group in bed. Okay, by midnight. And you're thinking, hang on, how the hell did you get a full team back to the hotel and in bed by 12? Uh, very being very demanding, cajoling, and also creating the environment for them. Right, so we got them in their beds, without TVs, without phones, in dark light. We gave them uh, sleep hygiene equipment, i.e. an eye mask and noise cancelling um, earplugs. We created an environment to try and help them sleep. The other group, do what you want, okay, except alcohol consumption. So they're playing games, talking, and staying awake till like 2.30 in the morning or two o'clock in the morning. And then we got them back the next day for testing. Okay, so pretty solid. Ironically, or so as you expect, sleep improved. So that two hours extra, and even though it was right after a match, creating that environment to actually get to sleep, improved their sleep by about two hours. However, the next day, no real effect on performance, doing yo-yo intermittent sprint performance. It was a highly competitive group environment, multiple teams there, they were pushing hard. So they could get themselves up for physical performance the next day. So it sort of shows you that it's not clear cut. You know, improving sleep is important, but players can get up following sleep, di sleep disruption. You have to go out to five, six, seven hours lost of sleep to really get an effect on physical performance. But it's not an ideal situation. So if you're finding players are regularly losing sleep or regularly have poor sleep, simple interventions by creating an environment, sleeping with a sleep mask, taking away electrical activity, i.e. phones, TVs, you can improve the volume of sleep that they're getting by making them follow simple, simple protocols. All right, nutrition is an obvious one. And I'm not a nutritionist and I'm not gonna tell you what, actually no, I am gonna tell you what you already know, but I'm gonna remind you about it. This is a simple study, it's not really a recovery study, but I love it because I've spent most of my career chasing ghosts, you know, chasing 1% improvements for a lot of work. This is an example of whereby just not doing the basics causes a massive reduction. So two days of exercise is more of a lab-based study. One day of a fairly large 
off legs volume of work on a cyclogometer. Okay, next day was a high intensity running session. They either were in two conditions. One was a high carbohydrate, one was a low carbohydrate. The sexy little thing about this is we lied to them. We lied our backsides off to the players, right? We told them that this was a meal replacement. You know, teams are going to Southeast Asia, the food can be difficult. We want to see whether having one of these two different meal replacement <coughs> intakes would be more beneficial than the other. Complete and utter lie. Yes, we did get it through ethics, don't worry. What we gave them was either high carbohydrate or low carbohydrate. Funnily enough, they came back the next day, their muscle carb carbohydrate massively reduced. And then even though the players didn't actually know it, from the very first minute of performance, they went worse. Right? From the very first minute, they went worse, the red line. So it speaks to the obvious. Ensure you have sufficient carbohydrate intake. You know it, your players know it, but it's like one of those things. Sleep, nutrition, often happens away from the club. Are you eating right? Yes, I am. What does right mean? How much is right? When is it when you eat? Those kind of things happen away from the club when you don't actually know. And funnily enough, they're the biggest drivers of recovery. Add protein to your carbohydrate intake. It's fundamental without getting, pretending like I know physiology too much. Protein aids the carbohydrate intake or the uptake into the muscle. Um, it's also important that as soon as there's protein present, the signaling in your muscle to build muscle just goes ballistic, right? So if you've got damage, stress, and you add protein, then the rebuilding process starts. The sooner you add protein post-exercise or post-match, and the larger that protein to a degree, particularly whey protein, the faster that muscle uptake is and the faster that building. So nutritional intake, both for performance and physiological recovery, paramount. Alcohol. Look, I'd, I'd love to stand up here and say everyone should you know, abstain from alcohol, but I'd be a hypocrite, but I'll do it anyway. No, I won't do it. So alcohol intake is obviously a fundamental part of the culture of most sports, don't deny that. Uh, we've done a couple of studies where we've actually taken teams following matches and we've given them alcohol that night. So yeah, everyone's like, yeah, I'll be part of that study, let me in. Right, so